Good morning, Broken Bow Assembly and all of those who are joining us online. We welcome you to today's service and we just want to um, bless you this morning. So good to have you join us. And we know, you know, the times are different and uh, it's different for us. We know it's different for you too. But we know that God is with you. God is with us. And there's just such peace and comfort in that, knowing that our Savior cares for us and he's right by our side. That's what the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the one that's right alongside of us, he's right here every moment of the day. And so we just want you to know how much we love you, how much we miss you, we miss you, miss you, miss you. <laughs> and we can hardly wait until we get to see your faces back here in the sanctuary. And we really believe that's going to be soon. We've been praying and decreeing and just, we believe this coronavirus is dead and it's just gonna start dissipating over our whole entire nation. And so we just keep praying for that, pray that protection over you and us and, and uh, this area and the nation. And so this morning, I know Pastor, he's, he's talked to you about, you know, taking your daily medicine and he was referring to Psalms 91 in that, and that um, sometimes we need to take it several times a day and just read that scripture to encourage us. So this morning, I just wanted to read part of that uh, for you uh, real quick here as we just agree together with the Word of God and there's power in agreement and we know that as you agree with us that there, there's a, a release of angelic activity uh, behind this word. So Psalms 91, I live in the shelter of the Most High. I am under His shadow. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge and my place of safety. He is my God and I trust Him. For he will rescue me from every trap and protect me from deadly disease. His faithful promises are my armor and my protection. I will not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. I will not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at my side, though ten thousand are dying around me, these evils will not touch me. When I open my eyes, I see how the wicked are punished because I make the Lord my refuge, because I make the Most High my shelter. No evil will conquer me, no plague will come near my house. And we say amen to that. For he will order his angels to protect me wherever I go. And I just pray this morning that that word brings you uh, peace and comfort and just a new strength and a new uh, uh, determination that you're going to go forward. Uh, you're not going to stay in a in a, a valley of of depression or uh, anxiety. But the Lord has given us His Word as our weapon, and I just hope that each one of you are using that Word, that you are proclaiming His Word, and you are in His Word daily to encourage yourself. This is the time we're quarantined, that you're supposed to be home. So you have some extra time now to be in God's word. And, and so I just pray that God's people are using that to the best of their advantage. So let's pray here this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Lord, we know that you are in control. We know you see everything that's happening and nothing is catching you by surprise. And Father, I pray and I know that your church is rising up with a new authority and, and we are commanding this sickness and disease to go in Jesus' name. Father, we believe there will be, uh, there will be medicine and, and just things that will help this to be over quickly. The, um, the scientists, all those people that are working hard to find vaccines or remedies, Lord, bless them. Empower them with your wisdom, we pray. Father, we pray once again for our president that you would give him wisdom in this hour. Mm -hmm. We pray for the governors of every state that you would give them wisdom in this hour. Father, I just pray for the churches that are, are um, because of not being able to meet together, the financial struggle is real. Father, I pray from coast to coast and border to border, you would bless every church that is finding uh, difficulty in their financial mm -hmm. situation right now. Mm -hmm. Father, I just mm -hmm. pray you would release the resources from heaven that would provide for your church. Father, I pray that you would also release those resources to provide for your people that have lost their jobs and are, are needing help in this hour. Father, I just pray this morning 
that as your word comes forth, there's hope, there's authority, mm -hmm. and there's power behind the word that will be spoken. And Father, and we just give you all glory and honor in advance. We know you are in control. Yeah. You're in charge. Mm -hmm. And we know that today, as we open our hearts to you, you will come in. So, Father, blessings upon our pastors. He brings the word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kenya. You know, uh, during this season, during this time that we're going through, uh, we're, we're not assembling officially. Uh, we, we, we are kind of, but uh, not in the capacity that we were before. It's, it's, it's different. This is, you know, I've told so many people, you know, when... Uh, I come and do these these sessions. It's it's weird not having anybody out in the congregation to see faces. But anyway, uh, it's good to good to be with you again. I hate not not assembling together like we normally do, but we're, we're just going to do what we have to do, and we want to give you the word and share the word with you. And I trust each and every one of you have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you and to the to the entire church. So uh, if you have them there, grab your Bibles, your iPhone, your iPad, you know, and if you have the phone on your iPad or your iPhone, hold them up real high. We're going to make this statement and make it boldly and say it like you mean it here this morning. Here we go. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. In Jesus name you are about to receive the incorruptible indestructible ever living seed of the Word of God you'll never be the same if you believe that can you say amen 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 turn with me in your Bibles to Romans first of all Romans chapter 13 we're gonna start in verse number 11 read down through verse number 14 and we're gonna go through other other scriptures here here today as well I want to talk to you about uh, a shifting that is taking place a shaking that is taking place you know and uh, here we, here we go. Prepare for quick shifts to take place and turbulent turnarounds. This shaking, this shifting, this sifting are not to hurt us, but rather these things are to help us, whether you realize that or not. God loves us too much to permit these things that are around us to clutter our lives. And during this crucial end time period that we are in right now, and this crucial time that we're in right now, we don't need to be dealing with some of the trivial things that are going on. We need to focus on the higher plans of God, the purpose of God. So it's time to wake up. Yeah. It's time to rouse to reality because God is releasing a shaking to remove everything that can hinder and halt us from our journey, from our purpose, from our plan that God has for us. Truly, it is a shake-up that is producing a desperate needed wake-up for the body of Christ. So in Romans 13, starting in verse number 11, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version to, right now. But in Romans 13, starting in verse number 11, here's what the Word of God says. Besides this, you know what a critical hour this is. How it is high time. Can somebody say high time? high time? High time. It's high time now for you to wake up out of your sleep and rouse to reality. For salvation or final deliverance is nearer to us now than when we first believed, adhered to, trusted in, and relied on Christ the Messiah. The night is far gone. The day is almost here. Let us then drop. Fling away the works and the deeds of darkness and put on the full armor of light. Let us live and conduct ourselves honorably and becomingly as in the open light of day, not in reveling or carousing and drunkenness, not in immorality and debauchery, which is sensuality and licentiousness. And that licentiousness means sexual excitement, that which is dirty, filthy, foul, and so on. Not in quarreling and je jealousy, but clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and make no provision for indulging the flesh. Put a stop to thinking about evil cravings of your physical nature to gratify its desires and its lust. So what, 
what I see in the scripture and what I read so many times in the, in the scripture, I see that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on the armor of God, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be so united and identified with the Lord Jesus Christ that we imitate his example as our pattern of life, as our pattern of, of living. This means that we need to adapt our lifestyles to his life, to his, his lifestyles, to his values, to his principles. We need to obey his word, obey his commands and become like him in each and every way that we live. And this calls for a complete rejection of all immoral behavior and the acts of the sinful nature that we see in Galatians 5 verses 19 through 21. I'm not going to read those, but you can go to that. Galatians 5, 19, if you want to. Christians must demonstrate outwardly the spiritual changes that have taken place on the inside of us. Amen. There needs to be a demonstration of that. So this shifting, this sifting, this change, it will be used by God to help each and every one of us in our alignment with God's plan, with His Word, with His purposes that He has for us. So church, for each and every one of us that are in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is high time. Now is the time to grow up. Now is a time to wake up. Now is a time to grow up into maturity and begin to start moving into the realms of the glory of God. We're to go from glory to glory, from image to image, from change to change. And we see in the, in the scriptures in Hebrews 12 and verse number 27, the writer of Hebrews declares these insights. And he says, here's what he says. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Another scripture in the Old Testament, Haggai, towards the end of the Old Testament, in Haggai 2, verses 6 through 9, this is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. And I love this next part. And it says this, And I will fill this house with glory. Says the Lord Almighty, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, in the place where you are, in the place where, you, where, where I, I am at, in this place, God says, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Amen. amen. I say amen to that. Bring it on. Scripture also states that God is God will shake everything that can be shaken in our life until all that remains is of him and not of us. Much like a strong wind blows the dead leaves off of, dead, off of the trees, God is blowing away all the unnecessary distractions that have lodged in the branches of our lives, of your life, and of my life. You see, God's plans are perfect. God's got a word. He's got a plan, a purpose, and a hope, and a future for each and every one of you. He is not attempting to hurt us, but what God is attempting to do is help us to be free from anything and everything that has attached itself to our lives, to anything that hinders us from bearing good fruit. That's the reason why this is all going on. You see, there's a greater glory that's coming to the body of Christ. I believe a greater glory is coming to, 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 to the realm of this earth. Pruning work has already commenced in the, in, in the world today. Before Jesus went to the cross, he gave a final, a, a final sermon to his disciples. And right in the middle of his sermon, his sermon he used a gardening, gardening analogy to describe the importance of growing spiritually and drawing strength from him who is the true vine. Jesus is the true vine. And here's what he said. Jesus said this, that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And then he goes on and said, every branch that does bear fruit, this is what he does. He prunes, he removes, he takes it away, that it may bear more fruit. John 15, 1 through 5, Jesus says this. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away, he trims off, he takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. And he goes on to say, you are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I have given you, the teachings that I have discussed with you. He says, dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Live in me and I will live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in and being vitally united to the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much abundant fruit. However, he says, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. So by, by remaining attached to Jesus as the source of life, the word of God says when we are attached to Jesus, we may remain attached to him, we produce fruit. And to produce spiritual fruit means to develop godly character within our life. Like it says in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We need to develop this fruit within us, develop this godly character within us. You see, the word of Scripture tells us, we read this earlier, that God will remove, He will prune from our lives anything and everything that takes away our devotion to Christ or hinders our life-giving connection to Him. So my encouragement to you is stay connected to Jesus. Constantly stay connected to Him. Yeah. In this hour that we live in, be dependent on, on Him in all your ways. And I know there are, there are many different ways, but some of the ways that I, 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 I looked at here today and in the past week, in the past, in the past years of my life, we need to stay connected to Jesus. And ways to stay connected to Jesus include spending time reading the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Meditate upon the Word of God so that the truth of God's Word gets in us and gets in, in you to stay connected to Jesus. Watch and pray. Maintain a habit of prayer, daily prayer, seeking the face of God and His ways. To stay connected to Jesus, to, to obey His commands. Stay connected to Jesus by loving people. Stay connected to Jesus by keeping our lives spiritually clean, by remaining in the Word of God day in and day out, by resisting temptation when it comes to way, it comes your way. We know temptations come our way, but what you do with that temptation decides whether you overcome or whether you are overcome by it. Another way to stay connected to, to Jesus is following the direction, the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. He wants to lead you and guide and direct, direct you. You see, what Jesus was telling his disciples and all believers everywhere, Christians, followers of Christ, that he was setting them apart and setting you and me apart for a lifestyle of bearing fruit, yeah. bearing good fruit. Their fruit would come as a result of God's intentional pruning. You see, God's plans are always best. You see, a wise vine dresser, he doesn't just let his fruit grow wildly, wildly on its own. To produce the best fruit, here's what he does. He follows the rules of pruning by cutting away dead or overgrown branches to encourage more growth, more fruit to come forth upon on the vine or upon the tree, whatever it may be. And like the branches in the story of Jesus, in, in Jesus' story, each and every one of us are unique. We're different. And our pruning is not going to look, it, our pruning won't look the same with us as it is with other people. He prunes each and every one of us differently. And this is a process that we entrust to Him. We want Him to do with, with us, knowing that He is good and He is working within, within our lives. You see, whatever can be shaped, shaken, the scripture says, will be shaken. This is a benefit and blessing so that we will not waste time on unimportant things. Hebrews 12, 27 through 29 says this. Now this expression, yet once more, indicates that the final removal and transformation of all that can be shaken, that is, of that which has been created, in order that what cannot be shaken may remain and continue. Let us therefore, receiving a kingdom that is firm and stable, and listen to this, receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, it goes on to say, offer to God pleasing service. Offer to God acceptable worship and praise with modesty and pious care and godly fear and awe. For our God is indeed an all-consuming fire. Keep in mind what we just read there in Scripture, that God declares that His kingdom, that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is the kingdom that cannot and will not be shaken you see, God is not only shaking the things on here on earth, but He's shaking things in the heavens as well. You see, all the foundations of the heavens and the earth are, are shaking at this particular time in the time that we live in. Psalms 82 verse number 5 says this, That the magistrates and judges know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in the darkness of complacent satisfaction. 
all the foundations of the earth, the fundamental principles on which rest the ad administration of justice are shaking. You see, not only the earth, but also the powers of heaven are being shaken at this particular time and will continue to be shaken. Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not shed its light, and the stars will fall from the skies, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You see, church, extraordinary things are happening, and they will continue to happen. So why in the world does God shake his people? The reason why God shakes his people to correct us, to purify us for the kingdom of God. Titus 2.14. Jesus gave himself on our behalf so that he might redeem us, that he might purchase our freedom from all iniquity and purify for himself a people to be particularly peculiar to be his own. People who are eager and enthusiastic about living a life that is good and filled with beneficial deeds. You see, the scriptures also tells us that, that God shakes us to, shep, to separate the sheep from the goats. Matthew 25, all nations will be gathered together before him, and he will separate them, the people he's referring to, from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. Remember this, the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom of God. And it says in Romans 1.16 that it is the power, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. You see, the kingdom of God is the only thing that cannot be shaken. And believers and followers of Christ, Christians who make Jesus their rock and their fortress, will not be greatly shaken either. Psalm 62.6 says that he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense and my fortress. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. Jesus said in the scripture, there will be violent earthquakes and famines and pestilences, epidemics and plagues. There will be sites of terror and terrorism and great signs from heaven in the sun and the moon and the stars, like sun, sun flares, cosmic disturbances. And upon the earth, there will be distress of nations, bewilderment, perplexity, not knowing which way to turn at the roaring of the sea, like tsunamis and that sort of thing. Men will faint and die with fear and apprehension, with the expectation of the things that are coming on in the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Luke 21, 25 through 26, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and stars and upon the earth. There will be distress and trouble and anguish of nations in bewilderment and perplexity, without resources, left wanting, embarrassed, in, in, in doubt, not knowing which way to turn, at the roaring or the echo of the tossing of the sea, men will be swooning away or expiring with fear and dread and apprehension and expectation of the things that are coming on the, on the world, for the very powers of the heavens will be shaken and caused to totter. You see, God is doing something in the entire world today. He is at work in the entire world. He's shaking everyone, shaking everything all over the world, everywhere. There's no use asking God not to shake us because it is his will and his purpose and power to do it. So that the only things that cannot be shaken are gonna be the, those things that will be left. That, that will be left. So, what, so what in the world, you, you may be asking me, Rick what, Rick, what can be shaken? The answer to that question, to the things that can be shaken are these things. Churches are being shaken right now. All throughout the United States of America, families are being shaken. Individuals are being, being shaken. Governments are being shaken. Wall Street is being shaken. You know, kings and kingdoms are being shaken. Banks and businesses. Everything else that is not eternal is being shaken in the day and the age that we are living in. And the only way that we can cope with God shaking is, com is, com is to commit ourselves completely to the hand of God. First Peter 5, 6 says this. Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up in due season. That at the proper time he may exalt you. Only God. You know, he is the only security we have. 
Kenya read Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High abides in the shadow of the Almighty. He is my refuge, my fortress, our God, and whom will we trust? You can go on and read read that the rest of that chapter a little bit, bit later. But we are told very firmly not to love the world. We're told in the Word of God not to love the things of the world. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires or the lusts of the flesh, the desires or the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the word says, it goes on to say, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whosoever does the will of God abides forever. Can you say amen to that? Amen and amen. Second Peter 3, 10. If our hearts are set on the world and the things the world can offer, the love of the Father is not in us. Did you hear that? And we will not stand up under the pressure of, of shaking. The world along with some of heaven is eventually going to pass away and be burned up. And so we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth. You see, nobody has a permanent home here upon this earth. If we try to make our home, if we try to make our dwelling in this, in this world, then we will be greatly shaken. But he, the word of God says, he who does the will of God will abide, will live forever. So even when we are shaken, even if we are founded on the rock, who is the Lord Jesus Christ and doing the will of God, the word says that we will not be swept away. The ultimate will of God is the coming of his kingdom. Uh, and I declare the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here and right now. The ultimate will of God is the coming of the kingdom to earth. As we read in the Lord's prayer in Matthew 6 and also Luke chapter 11, your kingdom come. That's God's kingdom. Your kingdom come and your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Church, we need to pray for God's power to be shown here upon this earth. We need to be pray. We need to pray and be believing for God's power to be shown among, among men and women and his purposes to be accomplished here on earth at this present time. Amen? Amen. We need that now more than ever. This includes following the instruction of Jesus' word and exercising his power among his people in order to destroy the works of the enemy today, to heal the sick, to save the lost, to promote the truth of the gospel of the kingdom of God. This is the ultimate purpose that we have. This is the ultimate purpose that we are here upon this earth today, to, to destroy the works of the enemy, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to save the lost, to promote the truth. That is why we need to proclaim this powerful gospel of the kingdom of God to the entire world before he comes back. Amen? Amen and amen. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6 and verse number 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. And I see this not only as a church, the people of the body of Christ being shaken, but also the unsaved are being shaken. And you say, why are they being shaken as well? The reason why they're being shaken is to bring them to God. So that they are turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I know being shaken by God can be very, very unpleasant. But church, if we yield to his discipline and his correction, we will be purified and made whole in him. Amen. And I know God so many times often pulls us out of our comfort zones so that we can grow deeper and deeper in, in our walk and our relationship with him. Sometimes we go through a cold winter so that our roots will grow deeper and deeper into our source, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Other times we enjoy the spring season of abundant rain and so on. No matter what season you're in, no matter what season we are in, and no matter what season the world is in today, God is always there. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He forsakes us. He is there with us. So don't miss the process. Don't miss the purpose of the process. Don't miss that. Listen, God is not trying to shake us to torment us. A shaking is going on to wake us up, to awaken us. And if you're receiving your affirmation, if you're receiving your love and your self-worth and your joy and your strength and your acceptance from any source but God, he will shake it. He will. He does not do this just to cause you pain. Rather, he does this to pull you closer to himself. It is only in Christ Jesus that we live and move and breathe and exist and have our being. It is only in Christ Jesus that we have life and life more abundantly. But I do want to give you a warning before we leave here today. Make sure, make sure you don't attempt to rebuild what God 
is shaken out of your life. Let me say that one more time. Make sure you don't attempt to rebuild what God has shaken in your life. You see, he wants to rebuild everything in you so that your only life source is him and in him and through him. It's time that we submit to the truth of God's word so that we can experience his true freedom. And even though God is shaking you as individuals or shaking your families or shaking your cities, your churches and your finances, you know, our, 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 our nation and our world, even though God is shaking us, he's preparing you, he's giving you an unshakable kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. What should our response to be? Our, our response should be a thankful heart, knowing that God loves us more than anyone. He loves us. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, let us be grateful. Let us be thankful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is an all-consuming fire. You see, I can never... I could never pay him back for what he did for me. Nobody can. I could never pay him back. See, Jesus knew that I was going to hell because I, I was a sinner. That was and is the price for my sin. The wages of sin is death. That was the price for my sin, eternity in hell. Jesus knew about all the times that I was going to mess up. He knew every single bad choice that I would make. He felt every disappointment that I would cause him. All of these things rang out to him as he was being mocked, as he was being spit, as be, beaten, as he was being spit upon. He could hear my voice among the crowd that day. My voice was resounding because in, in my own way, through my own sin, I have mocked, I have beaten, I've spit in the face of God, so to speak. I, I, I did that. I made, it was, it was, I, I was not the only one, but I made him go to the cross because there was no other way for me to spend eternity with him. I felt in my own life from time to time completely unworthy, unworthy because of my failures, unworthy because of my imperfections, unworthy because of my lack of importance to other people. But Jesus, knowing all of these things about me, and knowing all these things about you, seeing all the things that, that make up who I am, he considered me worthy. Did you hear that? He considered me worthy even when, you, when we felt unworthy. We, worthy of him being tortured so that I might know his love that he has for me. Praise the Lord. Worthy of him being humiliated so that I might find my confidence and beauty through the Lord Jesus Christ. Worthy of him, Jesus, making himself nothing so that I can know how to make, make a difference in the lives of other people. Worthy to have someone love me so much that he would willingly die just for me so that I could be loved by him. He paid the price. The ultimate sacrifice to have, so that we could have worth in him. He carried all of our burdens. He carried my burdens, my mistakes, my failures, my sins upon, on his back up to that hill of Calvary. He felt the full weight of all of my pain, my disappointments, my anger, my betrayal, my hurts. And yet he kept climbing the hill knowing full well that I may never accept him. And yet he kept going anyway. He kept climbing anyway. He knew that I would have a choice to realize what he was doing for me and accept it and follow him or completely reject the idea that he could really love me that much and continue. And I would continue to live in sin, totally separate myself from him, from him forever. He chose to love me despite the outcome, whether I accepted him or rejected him. You see, he took the weight of my entire life on his shoulders without getting angry with me. Not one step did he take in anger toward Calvary's hill because of the things I would do. But every step that Jesus took, he took because he completely loved you and he completely loved me. You see, I can say this with all of my heart. I know I'm, I'm married, I, I have a lovely, awesome, amazing wife, but, but I can say this, that no one has ever loved me like Jesus. No one has ever loved you like Jesus. He was nailed to the cross for you and for me. Every time that hammer 
struck those driving nails in deeper and deeper into the wood. Jesus felt my sin and your sin. Every time that Jesus cried out in agony and pain, wishing that it would stop, he felt our sin. He could have gotten off that cross at any moment that he was being put, nailed to the cross, but he chose to feel our sins, nailing him to that, to that cross. And you know what? He didn't hate us. Not once did he despise us for, for hanging him there. He prayed for us. He thought about who he created me to be. He thought about who I was to become and the hope that I would know him and love him in return. He loved me every second that he was there hanging upon that cross. He hung on that cross. He was broken and wounded and blood spilled out from his body. The darkest of death he went, went through and he hung there for quite, a, for quite some time thinking about you, thinking about me. And finally it came to the point when, at, at the, at, when he was almost died, when he's almost dead, he, before he, he passed away, he said, it is finished. It is over. Complete. It's, everything has been done. And, and at that particular time, he took our sin. He prayed, paid the price to save us from the pit of hell. Can you say prayer? Praise the Lord for that. Hallelujah. It is finished. It was my sin. It was your sin. It was our sin. It was the sin of the world that caused him pain. And I had to do nothing. He paid it all. He paid for it all. Every single thing that I have done, he paid the price for my sin and for your sin. He sacrificed himself for you and for me. Man, oh man, talk about that's hope, that's freedom, that's life, an abundant life. And the amazing thing is that it didn't end there. Listen, he didn't just die for me. But this is what he also did as well. He defeated Satan and he rose from the grave. You see, Jesus came to this earth to seek and save the lost. And to, defeat, and to defeat the powers of the enemy. So he defeated Satan. And he arose from the grave. You see church. I'm not only serving a loving savior, savior. I'm serving a living savior. And he's present with you now. He's present with me now. Today and every day. I don't serve a dead God. Or an empty idol. I serve a living God. Who is so very present. In every second of my, my day. I get to know him. I get to feel his love today. I get to feel his love every day because he's so real to me. He loved me so much. He loved you so much. He loved us so much to come to this earth and die and rise again so that each and every one of us can know him. And he offers new life to each and every one of us. You see, my old life is now gone. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's buried with him on the cross. My new life is ever growing. My new life is ever transforming me into who he has called me to be. You see, he is our helper. He's my helper. My strength and my shield, my song, my salvation, my portion, my deliverer. A song we sing around here every once in a while. He's the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness. My God, that is who he is. And he is so much more. And I choose to love him. I choose to love him. Did you hear that? Choose to love him with all of your heart. What I know is that it is not enough for me to just accept what he did for me on the cross and then continue to live how I choose, to live, to live the way that I want to. You see, he gave so much for me. He gave so, uh, gave so much for each and every one of us. Can I really do less than really, truly live for him? You see, it's not enough knowing that my sin has caused, caused him so much pain and grief and sorrow. My decisions and, and mistakes have had a price that he had to pay that I, I can just be thankful for what he did for me and not continually be aware of how my actions are afflicting and affecting him, excuse me. I must live in a way, and I wanna live in a way that doesn't hurt Jesus at all, that just doesn't hurt him anymore. Now that I understand what I've cost him, now I understand what incredible love he had for me. I want to love him back with absolutely everything that I am, don't you? I wanna love him back. You see, my life, I want my life to be a pure reflection of who he is in me. Amen. 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 He is so awesome. He is so amazing. He's a good, good father. 
He's the king of my life. I want him to be the king of my heart, king of my, my life. He is so beautiful. He deserves your love. He deserves my love. And I know that I can never repay him for what he did for me on, on that cross. But I can't offer up the only thing that I ever have that I ever have to give him in return. That's my life. Why don't you give him your life today? Surrender your life unto him. May it be completely his, dedicated to him. Follow after him, serve him. Let him be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the blood that you shed to bring us salvation and healing. Make us the righteousness of God. I thank you, Jesus, that you, that you paid the ultimate price. That we might know you, follow you, and do your will. Fulfilling your purpose, your plans your destiny that you have for us. Lord, I call upon you for each one here in this, that is hearing this message here today. Lord, there may be those that are hearing this message today. They, they may say, I know you, God, but deep down in their spirit, deep down in them, they don't have a relationship with you. They're not abiding in you. They're not abiding in, abiding in the true vine. Lord, I pray that during this time, Lord, that they would surrender their hearts and their lives unto you. They would make you their Savior and Lord. Lord, I, I pray that they would just, just be, be, be turned, they would turn to you with all of their, their heart. And they would say in, in, their, in their spirit, Dear Jesus, come into my heart. I repent of my sins. Cleanse me with your blood. Wash me with the water of your word. I believe in my heart, Jesus, you're the Son of God, and you rose from the dead, and I confess with my mouth that I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm forgiven, I'm on my way to heaven. So I have you, Jesus, in my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to be like you. I want You gave your life for me. I want to give my life to you so that you can live, my, live through me, that you can move through me. You can have your being through me. Jesus, I love you. Lord, I pray for every person that, that is listening to this message here today. Lord, that you would heal the hurt, the pain, the sorrow, the anguish, the shame. You'd heal the, the sickness and the disease, Lord, that they may be experiencing it right now in Jesus' name. Jesus, by your stripes, they were healed. And I claim that scripture in for them, their spirit, soul, and body, mind, will, and emotions. You said you took your word and healed them. You took up their, Lord, you took their infirmity and bore their sin and their shame and their, their sickness and disease. Lord, I, I, I thank you and praise you that, that, that healing is the children's bread, that it belongs to those in the body of Christ. And I release the healing word unto them. Lord, may they receive it by faith right now. Thank you for your anointing that is bringing this about, that is removing these burdens and destroying this yoke and setting them free. Thank you, Lord, that in Christ Jesus they're free and whole. We love you, Jesus. We love your ways. Lord, bless your people and keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious unto them. Establish them. Lord, pour out your spirit upon them. And Lord, Lord, give them God dreams and God vi visions and God encounters. And Lord, may the shaking that is going on, Lord, draw them ever closer to you. We love you. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day. Have a great week. God bless you. Stay connected to one another. Stay to connected to us. Stay connected to the church. We want you to be, when this is all over and done with, we know that God is going to be glorified. And great things are going to be accomplished through it. Love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.